Okay, well, hello everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Fernando and I come with the Region 9 Head Start Association and I will be your webinar host today. So feel free to contact me via the chat option of Zoom with any logistical questions you may have regarding audio, video, or connection issues. Please note that due to the current events related to COVID-19, our webinar platform Zoom is experiencing a high volume of activity. So if you're experiencing any lag or any constant connection issues, we apologize in advance for the inconvenience. With that said, as a registered attendee, you will have access to log back into the session at any time if you were to get disconnected. This webinar session today will be recorded and will be made available for on-demand consumption up on our YouTube channel within roughly 24 hours. You may access our YouTube account by visiting our website at www.region, the number nine, hsa.org. And then you will scroll all the way down at the bottom of our homepage where you will find a link to our YouTube account. Also, a certificate of participation will be available for downloading after the session up on our website as well. Uh, we encourage your participation today. So feel free to send us your questions and our comments and we will allow the last few minutes of the session to um, open up the room for any comments and any, uh, any uh, messages that we received and we'll address them if time permits. Uh, now it is my pleasure to introduce our topic for today, Pennywise, how to recession proof your finances. And from the Region 9 Head Start Association, here's Edward Condon to introduce the first speaker. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining us on this webinar today. This is a special treat to have for you, uh, as you may have uh, been following along this week, uh, the Region 9 Head Start Association has recruited and is presenting a number of webinars for you, uh, both to assist you in your roles in Head Start, as well as in your personal life. Our goal here is to bring you information that you need uh, in the roles that you're performing for families, for children, but also to bring you the knowledge and the understanding of what may be happening uh, beyond the, beyond the uh, daily tasks of Head Start so that we can bring you more comfort and wellness as we move forward together as a community. <clears throat> the Region 9 Head Start Association is very pleased to have the partnership of Mitch Haber from One America, uh, Brendan McCarthy from Nuveen, TIAA, and of course with George Frazier from the Frazier Group. Uh, these individuals are partners to the association to bring resources and support uh, through a number of means. And today, this is an opportunity to hear and enjoy the wisdom that they can bring us from the finance sector. And of course, our special guest who you'll hear from in just a minute, Peter Dunn, Chief Executive Officer, Your Money Line, Her Money. So with that, I'd like to uh, welcome George. Uh, George, thank you for your partnership with Region 9, your support of the Head Start community, and let's get started. Thanks so much, Ed, and thanks to you, Fernando, uh, for, for taking us who are less technology-wise into this world of Zoom. Um, we, we sure appreciate you taking the time. I appreciate you taking the time to, to join us today at what is a, a very difficult time for all. Um, and I have to tell you, at the, at the Fraser household, if it's anything like the rest of the households in the country, um, we used to call it formerly the empty nesting Fraser household. Things have changed dramatically. Um, my daughter, Casey, 22, and my son, Patty, 19, have returned home to roost. So life is different for us and for all of us. Um, we're, we're playing a lot of Scrabble, and I'm told that I'm not very good at it, so that's problematic. Um, lots of family dinners and movies, um, which is, I guess, one of the benefits of this. I want to share with you uh, a little bit, that because there's probably concern for all of you around your retirement plans. I want to remind you of one thing. Stocks go on sale. I want to equate it. You see a picture of this Starkist tuna can. Imagine if you could buy tuna fish at 10 cents a can. Um, we'd all be in there stocking up. Well, that's exactly what's happening in the market right now. It's been quite dramatic, but please know, um, the only time that you lose money in a plan is if you sell, and this is a time to stick the, with, the, with the program. I want you to think about today, because stocks are on sale, this might be a time to actually, if you can afford it, uh, to put a few more pennies from every dollar that you make into the plan. It's something and a little bit easier way to consider that this could be something that would, would make some sense. 
I want to tell you something else, though, that is super important. Um, while the value of your retirement plan, your 401k or your 403b may have gone down, there is one thing that has not gone down in value, and that's your social security account. So we all have, we're all, a lot of teachers on the line and uh, folks from Head Start. Um, I, one of the things that you know, you teach, you give homework occasionally, here's your homework. Everyone should go to www.ssa.gov. It's a social security website. And what you will find there, when you take a look at your account, you will see that virtually everyone in this line will have at least $1,000 a month at full retirement age. That $1,000 a month equates to almost a quarter of a million dollars between age 65 and 85, $250,000. And guess what? It has not gone down in value. So something that will make you feel a little better, it sure makes me feel better and better to be able to share that with all of those, uh, all of you on the line. Um, for, for many of you, you may have trouble getting through to 800 lines. Um, please know that I am available. Um, my team members, Fred Amberg and Troy Hagen are available to answer and, and help you with any questions you might have around your retirement plan, around general finances. Um, if we don't know the answer, we'll, we'll get the answer for you. Know that we're here for you and anxious to help. We are so proud of our association with Head Start and uh, the important work that you do. And we will all be getting back to work. We wanna make sure you are in the best shape possible when that happens. So to help you with that, we got a very, very special guest, um, Pete the Planner from Indianapolis, uh, Indiana. Um, he is a regular on CNN, on Fox Business News. He's written multiple books. He has a syndicated radio show. Um, he is funny and he can give you some, uh, I believe some really great um, suggestions as to how you can handle your finances today. And so with that, Pete, take it away. Thanks very much for your time, folks. And all are in our prayers that you and your family are safe. And we will look forward to a, a new day when we're back at it again, helping all those children that are so special to all of us. So thank you for the time and the opportunity. Thank you so much, George. And it is good to be with all of you today. Uh, you know, I've, I learned recently my mother-in-law was a school nurse at Head Start in Central Ohio in the 80s. So in an effort to always be in the good graces of my mother-in-law, uh, I'm glad to be with you here today. And so then I can call her and tell her that I'm still serving the organization that she gave so much time and effort to. As George mentioned, uh, my name is Peter Dunn. Uh, I go by the P name Pete the Planner. I write a column for USA Today every week in the financial section. But really what I'm obsessed with is... Uh, how do we solve the everyday financial problems that pop up in our lives? You got groups like George's group who helps you focus on your future so there can be a financial future. I'm obsessed with your present, which is your lifestyle. And I'm obsessed with your financial past, which are some of the debts that we've accumulated over time. In our time here together today, what I want to do is I want to begin to get you ready for what is likely a recession heading our way. So uh, let's get started. Here is the agenda for today. I'm gonna to give you some brief comments on to uh, what is happening in our economy and a little bit of what's happening in the stock market. Uh, we're going to establish our goals for uh, the next 30 days. We're gonna to put together a little bit of a plan that can help you with this. Give you some homework. I know you're teachers, so you're really familiar with the concept of homework. And I, well, here's what I know about teachers. A lot of times they're grading that homework at home but I am today giving you some homework. And then of course, we'll have some Q and A if there are particular questions that you think pertain to a lot of people in the group. I wanna be able to answer those questions for you. So there's three major problems going on right now in our world that we're all dealing with and we're all upset about or we're mad, we're sad, we're scared. And so the three issues are, are pretty obvious at this point. There's the, the virus, there's COVID-19. And I don't have any comments on that. I'm a financial guy. I am not a scientist. I just urge you to listen to the scientists. The other two issues I can weigh in on. One is the stock market with its with volatility, the up and down. And then there's the economy. So the stock market and the economy both are things that you see on the news and they can create fear and trepidation. But here's the reality. As George mentioned, that stock market really can help you provide a reasonable retirement for yourself down the road. It's something that you have to pinch yourself and convince yourself to stop staring at, despite the fact that it looks like a roller coaster right now. 
for the most part, what the stock market is trying to tell us right now is it does not feel very good about the economy and our plan to rebuild this thing. And let's shift to the economy. Our economy, it doesn't, it, it doesn't take a, a rocket scientist to figure this out. Our, our economy is struggling right now. If you drive down the street in the city in which you live and you see that nearly every store and every strip mall is closed, that's a problem for you and me. You know, there was that, I don't know if you saw this, but there was this image, this little video going around the internet a couple of weeks ago that was trying to show how important it is to stop the spread of the virus. And the illustration were a, a bunch of matches, you know, matchbook matches in a row. They were all lit. And then one match was pulled out of place, right? Do you remember, do you remember seeing that? One match was pulled out of place. And what happened is uh, the, the match, the last match extinguished before it could light the next match in line because we pulled one match out of place and so we stopped the ignition of the virus. And by the way, that's why we're social distancing and we're all at home, that's the concept. As it relates to the economy though, what we have to understand is that this next 30 days, 60 days, however long we're sheltering at home, you and I have to prepare our personal finances so that when it is time to get started again, we can pull people back into the economy who have been kicked out of line. We have to reignite the economy. You've got loved ones, you've got you know, significant others and kids and parents who are pulled out of the economy because their businesses aren't allowed to work, that they are effectively closed for business. We gotta pull those folks back in. And it is up to you and me to get our financial houses in order so we can help the economy when it's time to go. So here are our goals over the next 30 to 60 days. Some of this is easy, some of this is hard, some of this requires a, you know, a lot of thinking around the topic. Ideally, I'd like everyone on our call today to cut at least $250 a month out of their spending budget and then move that money into your savings account. You hear the concept of an emergency fund and sometimes you wonder what it really means. You and I both know it means just to have some money on a rainy day just in case things go wrong. But here's what it technically means. It means at least three months worth of expenses. So if you make $2,000 a month, you would ideally like to see $6,000 in an emergency fund. Now you hear me say this and you instantly are thinking, well, wouldn't that be nice? I feel you. I understand. I get it. And I'm not telling you you're wrong if you don't have an emergency fund. But what I am telling you is that by cutting your spending over the next 30 to 60 days, and let's say you cut it by $250 a month, that's $500 we can move into that emergency fund to help with any trouble that may be ahead. You know, you're, you're fine right now, but maybe you have a significant other that's income has been affected by this situation. You know, the stimulus plan that is uh, now in force and beginning to hopefully get checks in our bank accounts within the next two to three weeks can certainly help fill that emergency fund. And if you happen to have a family member or, or someone that you share finances with go on unemployment, they're going to get that enhanced unemployment, which is your state unemployment benefit plus $600 a week for the next four months. Those are really good benefits. And, uh, you know, we want to make sure that you understand that. The next two things we want to accomplish in the next 30 days, these are a little weird, so stay with me, but they're important. We want to press reset. I don't know about you, but there's times in my financial life that I've looked at my spending and I've looked at my lifestyle and it felt like all of these expenses were put upon me, like someone else assigned them to me. And all of a sudden it's just my reality and it's my life and I don't feel like I got a choice in the matter. Well, the reality is I did get a choice in the matter and you have a choice in the matter now. You are hunkered down, safe at home. And if that is the case and you're not gonna be spending as much money right now because there's nowhere to spend money, it's an interesting opportunity to press reset on a, different, a lot of different areas of your financial life. I'll be honest with you, I'm never gonna tell you something to do that I wouldn't personally do. My wife and I, over the last couple of weeks, have sat down and say, okay, look, some of these habits are, are forced to change that we've had for years. So what are we gonna do? How are we gonna recreate our priorities as it relates to our spending habits? Then finally, what we want you to accomplish in the next 30 to 60 days is we would really like you to stop guessing. I think people struggle financially, people struggle with nutrition, people struggle with fitness and health in general, because we guess. 
we guess the amount of calories in a dish. We guess the amount of calories we're burning. We guess the amount of exercise we're getting. We got to stop guessing and we got to start measuring. You know, it's interesting. We do a lot of studies around people's behavior and their thoughts around their own money. And what we find is most people don't have a real estate, a realistic uh, opinion about the, the state of their finances. They either think it's, things are fine and they aren't, or they either think things aren't fine and they really are. What I'm telling you is you and I, on average, most people don't actually know whether they're winning or losing. You know, income is not the main factor in this because oddly enough, the more money your household makes, the more likely you are to have uh, overconfidence with your ability to thrive financially. People at just about any income level can have a great financial life, especially into retirement. George mentioned, you know, pennies on the dollar, making sure you set money in the retirement plan. He mentioned the social security that will be there for you. Most of us can have that, but it really starts with stop guessing. One other thing I want to talk about before we get too heated and ready to go here. I happen to be a giant proponent of the concept of personal responsibility. When there is a problem, I love the idea that if I take responsibility and try to solve it, then it can get solved. That's great and all, but we're in some of the most trying financial times in the last hundred years in our country. So if you need help right now, don't feel bad about tapping the stimulus program. If you have someone in your family that is seeking unemployment benefits, there's no shame in that. Um, you can't concern yourself with the fact that uh, it's shameful to accept help right now. It is not. It is the right thing to do because if you are stable, then we can move on as an economy. Because like I said earlier, our goal in the next 30 to 60 days is to stabilize you so we can inject your power of spending back into the economy. All right, here's our plan for today. Very specific. These are our lessons, if you will. Number one, we're going to learn how to count transactions. I don't know if you know this. People hate budgeting. Yeah, don't you like that? You jumped on a webinar today. So some guy who's written a couple of books can tell you that people hate budgeting. You probably could have taught the webinar if that was the content today. People hate budgeting. So I wanna show you um, an interesting way to take care of that. Number two, I'm gonna show you very specifically about how to make some budget cuts and how to build a spreadsheet around your budget. And we're gonna take a look at your credit report. I'm gonna show you what matters, what doesn't matter, a credit report is a really interesting thing, and we'll get there in a second. I would tell you that most people think their credit score is much more important than it actually is. Yes, it allows you to borrow money. Yes, it affects the rate on car insurance and homeowners insurance and things like that. But I've met plenty of people with really good scores who are in really bad shape. And a lot of people with really bad scores who are in really good shape. So we want to make sure that you're getting the right information from your credit report. Finally, right before we hit the Q&A, uh, we're going to show you how to stabilize your financial life in the next 60 days or so, and then go. Your community always needs you, and you always deliver. You're in the business of helping people. And I think what is interesting about educators is a lot of times they're not so great at accepting help themselves because they're just so used to giving, it's hard for them to receive. Well, if you're addicted to giving and giving and giving to your community, the best thing you can do is pay attention, get stable for the next 30 to 60 days, and then you will give by spending into your community appropriately. All right. So I originally wrote a lot of what we're talking about today. Back in 2009, I had more hair. I was a little bit thinner. I'm very uh, Midwestern build these days. I'm very soft. doesn't matter. I wrote this originally in 2009, coming out of the big recession that was 2008, 2009. And what we found is we did a study and we found that in 2009, the average American household spent money over 20 times per week as a household. Okay, let's pause for a second and figure out what that means. I mean, consumerism, right? Consumerism, things like uh, uh, going to uh, the grocery store, that counts as a transaction. Going to pick up coffee on the way to work, that certainly counts, lunch, dinner, any transaction counts. Picking up dry cleaning, you know, that counts. Getting gas for your car, that counts. Here's what doesn't count. You know, daycare expenses for yourself, that wouldn't count. Uh, car payments don't count. So no bills, but discretionary spending. 
So we found most people spent over 20 times. And you're thinking, well, why does this matter? What we found is the more times a person spends money, the less they care what their buying costs. I'm gonna say that again, because it's a little tricky. The more times you spend money, the less you care what your buying costs. You become numb because the hit of dopamine that's released when you purchase something comes with the transaction itself and not the price of the item. So we found when people would spend money 10 to 15 times per week as a household, that's you know two adults, that their per transaction dollar amount actually came down, not went up. See, most of us think if we spend less times in a week, and we have fewer transactions, then the price per transaction will go up because we're gonna buy the same amount of stuff. It's simply not true. What you will do is you will start solving uh, non-financial problems with non-financial solutions. Here's what I mean. Let's say you're thirsty on the way home from work for a long day of instruction and helping kids, right? Say you're tired, you, you, you just want something to drink. So you stop at McDonald's and you get a Diet Coke with crunchy ice, you know, McDonald's. It's funny, we, can, we don't go to these places right now. So you start, you know, thinking about the little things like crunchy ice at McDonald's. In that moment, you're thirsty. That's, a not, that's not a financial problem. That's not a financial challenge, right? It's a thirst issue. If you wait to get home, turn on your faucet and drink some water, you've solved a non-financial problem with non-financial means. Unfortunately, what most of us do when we're addicted to transactions is you tend to solve non-financial problems with financial resources, and that becomes an issue. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to grab your January bank statement. We're going we're gonna to rely a lot on January's bank statement today, okay? If that means you have to go online to get it, great. If you have to print it off, great. If you're just going to look at the screen, that's fine too. If you actually get your statement still mailed to you, go find it. You know, take it out of the guinea pig's cage. It's not for the droppings anymore. It's for studying. And I want you to count, just with tick marks, how many times the adults in your household made a consumer purchase in the month of January. Of course, then take that total, go to your phone, pull out the calculator app, put the total in there. Let's say it's 150 or something. Divide by 4.33. That's how many uh, weeks are in the average month, okay? So take the total, divide by 4.33. That will tell you how many transactions you have per week, the two adults in your household. Your goal is 10 to 15. Now look, when, I, when we did this program originally back in 2009, I wanted to see how extreme you could make it. So my wife and I went through this experiment where we tried just five transactions over the course of one week. Grocery store, right, on Sunday. Gas for her car, gas for my car, so we could get to and from work. Do you remember driving? Oh, that was fun. Uh, then we also, I got lunch out one day at work instead of taking my own lunch, and she got coffee on the way into work one day instead of taking her coffee. That was five transactions. Now, here's the thing. Great, interesting, you learned something, but here's what really happens. It's the weeks after that special week of five transactions where all your behavior changes because you start solving non-financial problems with non-financial resources. You consider every transaction and it's not tedious. It just makes sense. You've pressed reset on your spending. So here's the math. If you're above 20 transactions per week as a household, you got a little bit of a problem. If you're above 30, boy, am I glad you took the time to be on this uh, workshop today. I'm glad George and Ed and, and Fernando, I'm glad everyone put this thing together because we've just determined one of the major challenges in your financial life is you just spend money too frequently. It may even mean you spend too much money. But I do know from a habit standpoint, you spend money too frequently if you're over 30 transactions. Now I want to talk about making budget cuts. And I mean this. I'm going to say something very dramatic. And I apologize, I get, I'm a little bit of a drama king from time to time. Here's what I tend to do. There is no time ever in the history of modern American finance that it will be easier to make budget cuts than right now. You can't spend any money. What are you going to go get a massage? You can't go anywhere. No one can touch you. You can't touch anyone. You can't spend money. It's really hard, right? If you can't cut spending now, I don't know when you can. 
And not only that, but think about all the fear. Think about, think about what your worry is for your family and, and for the, your, your personal economy and the economy at large. If you can't make changes now in the face of this stress, when can you? You know, there's this thing uh, with our health and with our finances that oftentimes people don't make the proper changes they need to make until it's so scary and so bad that they're forced to change. It'd be great if we just saw a problem from the distance, things were fine, and we were able to say, well, it could be even better. Let's make a change. Some people can do that. I can't. I don't exercise enough until my pants are too tight, right? And when they're too tight, I say, ah, okay, things are bad. I want these to fit. And so I go do something, right? I'm telling you, you have an opportunity to make a big change in your financial life right now by cutting some of your spending. I want to show you specifically what that looks like. Before we do that, though, I want to convince you that there's a good reason to budget despite the fact that the B word is a bad word. No one likes it. But there's three reasons why I think you should do it. The first is awareness. Okay, stick with me for a moment. You check your online banking account because you want to be aware of how much money you have, right? And since the late 90s, this is what people have done. Arguably, online banking is the greatest convenience tool in the history of modern finance. However, it also creates a lot of really bad habits. The more you look at your balance, the more money you will spend. The more you look at your balance, the more money you will spend. You think you're being smart by saying, well, I, I wanna be aware, I wanna see what I have but you're doing something we call balance spending. That is to say, you are making decisions based on the number of resources that are in there. Again, sounds smart, it isn't. And besides, if you're so aware because you check all the time, why would you have to check all the time, right? Think about it that way. You're trying to be aware. Okay, so now you're aware, you check today. Well, why do you have to check tomorrow? You were aware yesterday. You're just, you're spending out of control and so you lose that awareness so fast. It's fleeting, right? So checking your balance becomes a crutch. If you are truly aware of your finances, you know how much money's in your account all the time and you don't even have to look. And that doesn't mean you're tedious or that it's hard to do. You should probably look at your account once or twice a month. And if that sounds crazy to you and that sounds like a massive stretch, oh, I'm glad you're here. We got work to do. It's very infrequently I see a person who checks their, their balance on a regular basis, like every day. Very infrequently does that person have a good financial life. You might think that you need a lot of money to not check your balance. I totally disagree. You need good behavior to not check your balance. The next thing, you know this, your educators, the importance of proper communication in your line of work is paramount to people learning. People can't learn unless you communicate concepts clearly. And I think if you share finances with somebody, you owe it to your relationship. You owe it to your, your future to get on the same page financially. Yes, I understand that's easier said than done. Some bald guy in Indiana is telling you to talk about money with your lovey-dovey. But it's easier said than done. Let me tell you this. You got to do it. You got to come together because you were raised by different people. You have different views on how money works and how it's used and, and, and what your dreams are. Again, this is one of those moments where to get through this with all of our own public fears and private fears that we have about what's going on, you got to come together. And hopefully, maybe you and your partner are sitting there watching this together right now. Maybe you can send them the recording. But I'll tell you this. This next exercise we're gonna do here in just a moment, I want you to do together, but I don't want you to spring this exercise on them. I don't want you to just say, hey, look, we're doing this tonight because some guy named Pete the Planner said to do it. They'll look at you crazy like, who's Pete the Planner? What you need to say is, look, I, I learned something today. Head Start's always looking out for us. I learned something today. On Saturday, can we take 30 minutes to go through this? Don't spring financial conversations on someone because the other person's never ready. Think how you feel when someone springs a financial conversation on you. Hey, let's talk about that. No, you got to mark the time. All right, so that's number two. Number three, 
Number three is when I personally figured this out, my financial life changed a lot. The reason you budget is to hold yourself accountable to your financial goals. And so it's in this moment you understand you got to have financial goals. And financial goals have to be very specific. They have to have a date attached to them. And they have to have a dollar amount attached to them. If you say, Pete, I want to get out of debt this year. That's a cool idea. It's not a goal. Pete, I want to pay off $386 on my credit card by May 1st. That's a goal because you can measure a win or a loss. Pete, I'd like more savings. Cool idea, not a goal, right? And so what happens is if you don't have goals, then not having a budget doesn't seem to matter. If you're the type of person that has a particular category of spending that where you constantly just spend too much and you know it and it's your funny personality quirk, oh, I dine out too much or I do like beer, you know, something like that. The reason why you let yourself off the hook is because there's no goal to hold you accountable to what you're struggling with. If you don't have that goal, what does it matter? It is just a personality quirk. But the second you look at your goals, then you look at your budget and you see that these mistakes are causing you not to accomplish a very specific time-driven goal, everything changes. Everything changes. So let's do this. I wanna see, I want you to see how to build a spreadsheet which will help you understand where your problem areas are. All right, so I'm gonna pull up a different screen here. Yep, that's right. I'm pulling up a spreadsheet. You might say I excel at them. <clears throat> Sorry, listen. I'm actually using the spreadsheet app on my Mac. Why? Well, here, it's a very specific reason why. I, I, I don't like this app at all. It's numbers, it's on my Mac, it's terrible. But I wanna show you how easy spreadsheets are that even the worst spreadsheet program in the world can give you good results. I prefer Excel and I prefer Google Sheets. If you have a Gmail account, you can use Google Sheets. But what we're gonna do I'll try to make it a little bit bigger here so you can see. Oh my gosh, look at that. I know my way around a computer. All right, if the sheet is blurry, I will, I just saw some feedback from that. Rachel, thank you for that feedback. I will do my best to explain with the pointer and talk. I just, uh, I just increase the size. Okay, so I want you to go to that January statement once again. And what we're gonna do is we're going to have the major budget categories in column A on a spreadsheet. Hey, this doesn't have to be perfectly formatted. It doesn't have to be pretty. This is for you. This is for you and your partner just to get some information to stop guessing. Okay. So for, you know, first mortgage payment or rent, you're putting the major categories here. There's no surprises, natural gas, electricity, water, waste, phone, internet. Then you get down to some discretionary categories like dining out and groceries, car payment, fuel for your car, car insurance. So you're going to put the major, obvious major categories on this sheet in column A, right? And then you're going to go to your bank statement and you're going to see some other expense categories that you forgot about that you can add on. Now, I have a little trick for you here. Uh, here's the trick. If you have a store that is your problem, just add the store as its own line item. Let's say you go to Walmart 13 times a month. Just add a Walmart line. Or you go to Target or you got an Amazon problem. Whatever it is, put that problem store on the list and make it its own category. And this is how it works. Across uh, you know, the top here in this other row, you put January, February, March, April, May. That's not too difficult. So then you just enter, let's say your rent payment is, I'm just picking a number, don't get upset with me. Let's say it's $1,000 a month. So as you go through your spending in January, here's what you do. You have your bank statement. One person in your relationship has the bank statement on the computer or print it out. They have a pen. If you're using paper, don't write on your computer screen. That's a bad budget move. And you just read off the expenses. Now, here's a question we're going to get in a few minutes. Someone's going to say, hey, Pete, is there, a, is there an app or is there a, some budget site that does this for you? Yes, there is. I don't want you to use them, though, because the most important part of this is having the conversation. It's for one person to say, you went to... Chick-fil-A 13 times this month? What's wrong with you? That's accountability. That's why this matters. If you have financial goals and you have that layer of accountability, that's what matters. Then what you do, let's go down to a category that's got a lot of expenses in it, like dining out. 
anytime you're using Excel, some of you know this, some of you don't. So I'm going to go uh, very basic here. Anytime you're going to enter multiple numbers in one cell, you just hit equals. You just hit the equal sign. Then you type in the number. So the first one's $23 and 24 cents. And you put the plus sign. Let's say you went and got some coffee one day and it was cheap. <laughs> and then you take the whole family out because it's grandma's birthday and you go to uh, a teppanyaki grill. I don't know. Then you just hit equals, it adds it up. What you're gonna do over time here, let me zoom back out on the spreadsheet here. Sorry about that, there we go. You're going to see what your spending is. And as you do it in February too, and March was one of the craziest months in the history of any of our lives, and then you're gonna see what happens in April and May, you're going to see where you cut spending. The reason I bring this up, as I go back to myself here, the reason I bring this up is if you want to cut spending from your budget, you got to know where it comes from. You can't just go, hey, all right, we're going to try harder now. We're going to watch our spending. None of that means anything. You have to know the categories. You got to stop guessing. A spreadsheet is a great way to do that. I got spreadsheets going back years I'm telling you the different categories. We take about 20 minutes a month or so to take care of it. And it's not that bad. All right, look. More on budgeting, I'm sure, when we get to the Q&A. But let's move on to credit reports here because I want to make sure to leave plenty of times for your questions. All right, I don't, this is weird. And, and you're going to feel like I'm insensitive or apathetic or something. I just have to be really honest with you. I don't care that much about credit scores. And it's not because I have a good one and I have money or anything like that. It's that they're really misleading. A lot of people, if I ask them about how healthy they are financially, they'll answer with their credit score. Like if I went up to you on the street, it's like, hey, how's your financial life? If you said, well, I have a 790 credit score, you think you're giving me information. But what you don't understand is that doesn't matter, right? You can't borrow in retirement. It doesn't tell you how healthy you are. It tells you how good you are at borrowing. My goal is to not borrow. And I think that should be one of your goals too. Now, I don't want to put my goals on you, but ideally, your goal isn't to be good at borrowing. Your goal is to not borrow. So yes, I want you to have healthy credit habits, but I don't want you to do things to make your score go up. This problem has gotten worse and worse over the last 15 years. You think about all the technology solutions, the, I'm not gonna name them by name, but we can monitor your credit and you got an app and it makes things go up. It's all leading to more borrowing. And that's not what we need right now. I am never going to, I told you so anybody. It's just never gonna happen. I'm never going to look at your financial life if you're struggling and say, told you, because it's not helpful. But right now, there are people in our country who believed that their credit score told them all they needed to know about stability and financial health. Man, I, I, it hurts my heart. The rude awakening they've gotten in the last couple of weeks. What do, what's a good credit score matter right now, honestly? Let's say their income, their job's gone, they have no savings. You're just going to go out and borrow with no income? It doesn't work that way, right? I still want you to go to annualcreditreport.com and here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to download your free credit report. Go to this website. This is the one I like. They don't pay me. So this is not like you go there and I get 13 cents or something silly. It's just, that's where I go and it's free. You're going to get all three of your reports. Uh, you've got uh, Experian, Equifax, and, trans, and TransUnion, it'd be nice if I knew the names, right? Experian, Equifax, and TransUnion. You can get all three of those reports right at annualcreditreport.com. You can get each of those reports once per year at annualcreditreport.com. It's not necessarily gonna tell you what your credit score is, but as you may have heard me mention, I don't particularly care about that. I wanna know what's on your credit report. I wanna know what accounts are open, what accounts are closed. I want to know which ones are in collections, how often you pay bills late. I want you to see the fraudulent accounts that you didn't know were on there. Remember that stop guessing thing we talked about? Most people just assume their credit's fine or they assume their credit's bad, but they don't necessarily know why. If you look at your credit report, what you might see is that weird cousin of yours who's always coming around, always seems like they got something going financially. They may have stolen your identity. Now, I'm not trying to throw anybody under the bus here. I just know that family financial fraud is a thing. 
And when you go to your credit report and you start to see you've got credit lines at stores you've never been to, Thanksgiving gets awkward real fast. So go to annualcreditreport.com. Just make yourself familiar. I, I hate to say things like, well, we got nothing else to do right now. It's kind of true though. I mean, I got a lot to do. I think we're all, we're just trying to better ourselves. We're trying to view this opportunity as an opportunity to strengthen our families and our relationships and our finances, and our faith and everything else. But go to annualcreditreport.com, look at your credit report. If there's something weird on it, you can dispute it with those companies. Don't pay for identity theft protection. It's a, it's a waste of money in most cases. What I would prefer you do is I would prefer you to just freeze your credit. By freezing your credit, you prevent anyone from using your social security number from asking for a new credit line. It will not shut down your credit cards or credit lines. It does not hurt your credit. It does not hurt your score. And it also prevents the credit bureaus from selling your data to other people who are trying to sell you stuff based on the behavior exhibited within the data. You know, the credit bureaus are for-profit companies. They're not bad, they're just for-profit. And how do they make a profit? 86% of their revenue, 86% of the money they make on a regular basis comes from selling your data to other people who want to sell you stuff. And the other 14%, so the remainder of their revenue, their income, comes from selling you identity theft protection to prevent people from getting your data. They're geniuses. Freeze your credit. And when you freeze your credit, they can't sell your data. And when they don't sell your data, people don't send you really clever ads that convince you to buy things that you shouldn't buy, but they knew you were gonna do that because they know your behavior. Because every time you go to Target or Walmart or whatever, and you swipe your card, it doesn't just record your transaction. There's probably 50, 100 data points, depending on how many items you purchased, about that transaction that tells who you are as a financial entity. That's what people are buying. People know you buy Dove soap. People know you buy off-brand Q-tips. They know these things and they build profiles about you. This is not like any weird sci-fi stuff where I'm a conspiracy theorist. This is just how it works. And you have to understand that. And the best way to prevent those things from hurting you is to freeze your credit. Uh, you have to unfreeze your credit. If you're going to go get a new car or apply for a loan or something like that, you have to be able to unfreeze your credit. So if you do freeze your credit, please understand, you need to keep your pin code. You will get a six to 10 digit pin code that if you lose it, you're gonna track me down and scream at me because you'll think it's my fault, but it's not. You gotta keep your pin code because you cannot unfreeze your credit unless you have your pin code. Okay, let's take a deep breath for a second here. The goal of all this, and by the way, you know, George and his folks, Ed, everyone's gonna, they're gonna see the recording of this. So if you need to watch it a couple times, pause, rewind, do whatever you can. But the point of this is to cut spending by at least 250 bucks a month. Some of you can do a lot more. You know what? And some of you might be able to do a little bit less than that. It's okay. It's okay. Doesn't make you bad. Doesn't mean you did anything wrong. Just means you're trying your hardest and you can't get up to 250. It's okay. The second thing we want you to do is use this opportunity to reset some habits. Hopefully you learned some things today that you can put into work. Finally, stop guessing. You know, as I look personally and study this financial crisis and talk about it on TV and radio and to great folks like you, I got to study the data. I got to study the research. I have to study the numbers. And I'm able to make judgment calls about that and, and try to analyze what it means to us all because I'm not necessarily guessing, I'm looking at data. You can make better decisions in your life with more data. When you have how much you spend at the grocery store, which store in your life creates the most problems from you from a behavior standpoint? These are the things that matter. These are the things that allow you to move forward. And it's with that, I have to tell you, I, I am hopeful for the direction of our country. It is gonna be the rockiest few months we are likely to ever experience. Now, I know some of you have had tremendously difficult financial circumstances that you've overcome and you've made it to this point. But maybe for the rest of us that have not had that difficulty, this is it, this is it. Now you have stability, the nature of your employment, 
but maybe someone else in your house you share finances with does not. So you got to get ready. And when we stabilize and this country opens back up, you better believe I'm going to be getting carry out for three months. I love cooking and it's been economically smart, but I need these restaurants, my friends, these owners, these servers, these bartenders. I want to see them back in this economy. I want to pull them back in line. So it's with that. I'd love to open it up for questions. Um, Fernando, if there's some questions that people have and people can start entering them now, maybe you've got some accumulated. If you want to unmute your mic and pop on, if that's all right, and maybe ask me some questions, I'll do the best I can to answer them. Excellent. Thank you, Pete. Um, we did receive quite a bit of questions. Some of them pertain to the content. Some of them pertain about where to get certain tools and resources that you shared. Um, so let me uh, go down the list here. So the first one um, is asking, should we add more to retirement plans? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, George touched on that a little bit. Let's say you find yourself actually pretty darn stable right now. And some of the things I'm talking about don't even make sense to you because you feel fine and, and things are good. You've got an emergency fund, you've got income and employment stability, and you're thinking, okay, well, things are fine. What should I do? George is right couple more cents on the dollar, increase that contribution to your retirement plan can make a lot of sense. Now, I don't personally believe, and I used to manage about $100 million of assets when I was an investment manager. I don't personally believe, this is for me, you know, I'm not a guy that's going to go look for the companies that are going to solve this problem and invest in those companies so I make millions of dollars. I don't care about any of that. Maybe that makes me a terrible investment person. I just think increasing your contributions on a regular basis on each paycheck going more into the plan, that's the way to build sensible wealth. You know, you got to do your best to avoid that get rich quick mentality, which can sting all of us. Uh, so yes, investing more now, if you have stability is really smart. Investing more now, if you don't have stability, doesn't make a lot of sense. It doesn't take into account the difficult times that, that we're all facing. So thank you for that question. Okay, so um, what is the best way to just start to budget? Yeah, so it, it begins with that bank statement. You know, sometimes, again, when I'm feeling not in such great shape, I can tell you the absolute last thing I want to do is step anywhere near a bathroom scale. I don't want to see how much I weigh. I don't want to know if there's a two in the first slot or a one. I really don't, honestly. The best place to budget is to go to your bank statement, look at the beginning balance at the beginning of the month, look at the end of the balance at the end of the month and start to make some judgment calls. Go, okay, well, this felt like a good month, but now that I look at it, it wasn't a good month. And by the way, what does it mean to have a good month? This is a really important concept. For some of us, when we say we had a good month without data, what we meant was the month was easy. It's easy to not work out, but that doesn't make it the right thing to do. To have a good month with data means that you had a surplus. You had more money left over at the end of the month. To have a good month with feeling means things were great. You went out to eat a lot. You got a new purse. You have a new car. Like That's the difference of understanding feeling versus data. So if you want to start budgeting, see what you've spent, get base data, and then try to reduce each one of those problem areas by 10% the next month. I'm gonna make up a number here, don't get distracted by it. Let's say you spent $200 on dining out in January and you, that's not sustainable, especially when this economy recovers. Let's say you want that to be closer to 150. What you would do is then instead of spending 200, uh, the next month you would try to make your goal 180. And once you accomplish that, and, and, and by the way, with food, it's, it's much better to break your food budget down to a weekly basis. I don't think you should have a monthly food budget walking around in your head. Always have a weekly budget. For instance, let's say it was $160 with your dining out budget. That means $40 a week in my head. That's much easier to keep track of than it's the third week of the month and you're like, okay, I've spent $117. No, don't do that. Just break it down into a weekly budget. That's the best way to start budgeting. Uh, we get a question asking, how can we distribute the money in stocks? Any websites you can recommend? Yeah, anytime you have questions about your investments, you know, George and his team can really point you in the right direction. 
their job, they are stewards of your future. And they are so concerned that you are able to put together a plan that gives you the life you've sort of always dreamed of. Uh, so talking to those folks, they can help you make some decisions. I know that uh, within your retirement plan through One America, you've got several different investment choices and making those decisions can be difficult. So talk to George and his team. They can put together an asset allocation model for you. They can help you understand what sort of risk you can deal with. I think sometimes people get in trouble because they want to be riskier than their personalities can handle. Here's the best way to think about it. If you lose sleep over your investment account right now, you may be under the wrong risk tolerance. I'll say this though, it, it, you wouldn't be alone if you're losing sleep over your uh, account balance right now because it's pretty crazy times. But if this stays happening and if you've always been worried about your, your, your account, then talk to George and his team and they can make sure you have the right risk tolerance. So that's a good question. What else you got, Fernando? What to do if you are paycheck to paycheck? Paycheck to paycheck. You know, I've been there. I think a lot of us have been there, if not are there right now. Uh, and what's difficult about that is to, for things to go well, everything has to go perfect. Paycheck has to come in. You can't get a flat tire. You can't get a speeding ticket. You can't get a vet bill for your dog. And so you're walking around with more stress, financial stress than anybody else out there. And so what ends up happening is oftentimes your stress level gets so high that you create your own problems. You'll go out to eat when you shouldn't. You will go shopping online just to make yourself feel better. So I think a lot of, a, a lot of those problems can begin to be solved by actually knowing your information to stop guessing. Financial stress is really tough for anyone of any income level, but if you are paycheck to paycheck, it kind of forces you into some bad decisions sometimes. Your goal should be to build up $1,000 in savings, one month's worth of income and savings. Maybe the stimulus check that's coming your way in the next couple of weeks if you qualify. Man, what a great way to build a little bit of a cushion for you, uh, depending on your family situation. But yeah, paycheck to paycheck is not easy. Um, but instead of not knowing your data, you should dig deeper into the data. And one other thing I want to say about that. Sometimes when I'm stressed about money, because I get stressed about money too, I don't want to talk about it. Like when I'm stressed about money, I, it's the last thing I want to do is talk about it. But guess what? When I talk about it with somebody, I feel better. And I think when you live paycheck to paycheck, you can have embarrassment around that. You can have shame around that. But if you find the right person to talk to about that, it's going to relieve some of that pressure. Uh, and that's hard to do. You have to remind yourself that every time you, you're in that situation. I know I do. Every time I'm in that situation, I talk about it with my wife and we feel better. And then she'll say, see, I'm like, I know. It's just hard. What else, Fernando? I think we have time for a couple more questions. What is the best way to eliminate credit cards? Well, that's a great question, and it's, a, and it's an interesting question based on the time we're in right now. I, obviously, I've been sharing a lot of my opinions with you today, a lot of facts, too. Uh, I, I want to give a, a special disclaimer for what I'm about to say is my opinion. I think paying off debt is a really important thing to do in regular times. I think that uh, the best way to pay off debt from a behavior standpoint is to focus on the lowest balance debt pay minimum payments on everything else, but pay as much as you can on that lowest balance debt until it is gone. Some people call that the momentum method. You've heard people call it the snowball method. I think that really works. You just line up your debts and order from balance, lowest balance to highest balance, pay minimum payments on all of them except the lowest balance and throw all your money at them. I think in normal times, that's the best way to go. However, very frankly, if you don't have stability right now, if you don't have an emergency fund, and we're in these economic times we're in, I would simply pay minimum payments on your debts. I would not pay an extra, a lot extra and try to get rid of them right now for the next few months. I think creating stability is the most important thing. I wouldn't even use your stimulus check to pay on specific debts unless it wipes out a debt that then frees up money on a monthly basis. I'm, I'm very weary right now of people aggressively trying to pay off debt. I don't think it makes sense for most people because I'm more concerned that people have 
savings in the bank if times get tough. What else you got, Fernando? How can you get uh, the wrong information off your credit? Man, I, I wish I had an amazing answer here. You can dispute that information with the credit bureaus, but you're going to have hit and miss luck. There are uh, different services. Um, there's the service called Info Armor. There's the service you've heard of LifeLock. Sometimes they can help with those things, but you should always try to uh, dispute those items directly on the credit bureau's websites, uh, and they can help you with that. It's hit or miss, though, if I'm being honest with you. Um, and I don't know how, what sort of volume they have right now, what sort of call volume. Maybe a lot of people are doing this. My gut tells me a lot of people aren't digging into their credit reports right now. So if you do have a dispute, maybe it gets more attention. So Fernando, maybe let's do one more question. Uh, I want to be sensitive to everyone's schedule. Sounds great. So uh, why is it important to freeze our credit? Uh, yeah, it's a good question, right? So I, I want uh, my, my front door to my home is on the other side of this wall here. And let's say at night, instead of locking the door, I just had a camera focused on the door. And so that if anyone walked in, I would then have a camera and it would say, oh, someone had come in the house. That's what identity theft protection typically is. It's just a camera on the door, but the door is unlocked, right? People do get in and then the camera sees it and then they fix it. Freezing your credit just locks the stinking door. It doesn't let people do things. If someone steals my identity and then they take that identity to Best Buy and they try to open a credit card in my name with my social security number, they can't do it with frozen credit. If I have frozen credit, they can't do it. If I've got identity theft protection, it'll happen and then it'll retroactively go get fixed. So freezing your credit just locks the door and it prevents the credit bureaus from selling your information. You'll no longer get prepaid of not prepaid, I'm sorry, pre-approved credit card offers in the mail, which is sort of a pain in the neck. Those happen because people sell your data. The second you freeze your credit, that all stops. I, I think every adult in our country should walk around with frozen credit and it, it doesn't cost you anything. It's just a good, it's like having a spare tire in your trunk. It just makes, it makes sense. So it's with that, um, I'll just leave you with just a couple thoughts here. Um, if you're scared right now, you know what? I am too. It's okay. We're all going to need each other. I think the really tough part about what we're going through right now is we all need each other, but we have to take care of that separately. We have to help each other from a distance. So stay vigilant about your financial life. If you're stressed and you feel like you want to do something to help what we're all going through, you can help by stabilizing your financial life so then you can invest in your community going forward. I want to thank Ed. I want to thank George. I want to thank One America, Nuveen, the partners that put this together, and Fernando for helping with the questions. Thanks for taking an interest in your financial life. And uh, I'd love the opportunity to, to speak with you again sometime soon. So thanks, everyone. I guess, Ed, I'll turn it back over to you. Pete, the planner, thank you for uh, such a wonderful webinar. I, I monitored the chat and the questions, and there was lots of affirmation that this is exactly what folks needed to hear. Uh, we'll be sure to make this recording available. Uh, in about 48 hours, it'll be posted. You can download it, share it with friends. Also, if you're looking for a certificate, you'll be able to find that by going to the Region 9 website uh, and look to the event uh, link, and you'll see the uh, certificate of participation there. Uh, thank you, Pete. Uh, thank you, George. Uh, thank you, Mitch, for setting this up and for your partnership with our Head Start community. Have a great afternoon, everyone.